We're going to have another senior sermon. Uh, Daniel is going to come and preach to us here in a bit. Uh, Danny is going to introduce, tell you a little bit more about him. But then Garrett uh, is going to come lead us in a song here shortly uh, as well. But uh, Denny, if you don't mind, I'm going to have you lead us in a word of prayer as well uh, when you're up here. Uh, we were informed right before services started that the Bevelock was grandson Tristan was in a car accident this afternoon, uh, just a little ways north north of here, right? Is that what you said? Uh, he was a little ways north of here. Uh, it was, uh, and the accident was at relatively severe, totaled his car, but he is okay. He's just sore, and so we want to praise God that there were no major injuries out of this. But we do want to pray for Tristan. We want to pray for uh, Don and, excuse me, pray for the Bevelacquas as they are uh, trying to wrap their head around it and so many other things that have been going on. Um, but we're looking forward to that, uh, that prayer, because we're going to lift that before God. But Denny, I will turn it over to you to introduce our speaker tonight. As we continue our senior sermons tonight, we have Daniel Besterwich. Daniel is one that came to us from California. And as most of you know, I've been at the Bible Institute a long time. Uh, since 1985 and in that length of time I've seen a number of students that for uh, various reasons drop out of school and very very rarely do they come back a lot of times they'll say they're going to come back uh, and they don't come back for uh, different reasons Daniel was one that uh, was relatively close to the finish line Um, But because of some issues that he had going on, uh, did drop out of school. And uh, we had hopes that Daniel would be one of the exceptions that would, as things got settled out in his life, would in fact come back to school. And sure enough, I got an email from Daniel and he said, uh, uh, would you guys take (laughs) take me back? And uh, we said, of course, we'd love to have you come back. And so... Uh, he made it happen and returned uh, to finish up his schooling and will graduate now uh, in a few weeks. Daniel is one that has a heart for missions. His hope is, uh, upon graduating in May, uh, to start securing funds and would like to go to South America, specifically would like to go to Lima, Peru. Uh, We do have a school down there and we also have another graduate that's that's working in Peru, but um, we're hoping that Daniel can utilize his uh, language skills and also his love for missions in uh, making that happen and going and working in South America. We would love to have another Bear Valley man in that area, and I know that uh, Daniel's love for the Lord, love for his word, love for the lost will be something that will benefit him greatly as he goes and works in the mission field. So looking forward to hearing a message from our brother Daniel at the appropriate time. All right, let me lead us in a word of prayer. Father, we are thankful that we're able to come together tonight and to hear a message from your word. We do pray for our brother Daniel as he uh, preaches that he will accurately preach your word and that we will be good listeners. Uh, with the intention of learning and applying the message that comes from your word. Father, we also want to bring before your throne, Tristan, and the the information that the Bevelacquas have given us regarding his accident. We are thankful that he apparently has escaped uh, serious injury, but still accidents, especially those that total vehicles, are traumatic events and So we pray for his mental and emotional well-being as well as his physical well-being. We also want to continue to lift up uh, the the Bevelacqua family, Rodney and Don, as they are dealing with various uh, health issues. In addition, uh, we continue to remember uh, Shana K. Jones and Greg Swackhammer and the various health issues that they are dealing with. Father, we want to praise you tonight. We want to glorify you in our song and in our uh, time of studying your word. 
we're grateful for the Bear Valley congregation, for the many ways that you've blessed her. Pray that you'll continue to watch over all of us. And this we pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. One hundred and fifty, follow me. We'll sing all three verses. I travel down a lonely road and no one seemed to care. The burden on my weary back had brought me to despair. I often complained to Jesus how folks were treated. So first, I have to start out. I have to start out by saying thank you to this congregation. Uh, thank you, um, sincerely. I think this is a great work. Uh, two years at school has truly has been life changing, and uh, everyone who is supported it and who has been a part of this congregation is really a part 
of a great work, and I mean that. I want to start by asking two questions. I'm going to ask two questions just to ponder up as we go through uh, this evening. And the first one is, if you had to describe God, if you had to define who God is, how would you define him? You know, I'm not sure that's possible to do with human words. But if you had to describe him, how would you do it? Be thinking of that. And then the second one, is there something in your life, is there a particular sin that you have struggled with consistently and maybe you have prayed about it and you've tried your best to repent and you've done your best but you just keep falling victim to the same thing and you choose the same sin? How do you feel when that happens? Do you necessarily want to pray to God right away? Or is there a period of time where you might try to hide and stay away from praying to God? So be thinking of how you would describe who God is and think of that as we go through this evening. I'm going to take us through three sections today. So to clarify it simply, we'll do section one, some scripture, section two, and then section three. And then I'm going to give you three examples after that. So we'll do three sections and three examples. Then we'll go to one last passage of scripture to show the importance of it. And then I'll leave you with that illustration. So if you're willing, please turn to Exodus chapter 2 and we'll start there. And bear with me because we'll turn to a few scriptures today. But the first one, and I'm going to give you three in section 1, is Exodus chapter 2. And I'll read starting in verse 23. And it says in verse 23 of Exodus 2, Now it happened in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the slavery. And they cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery rose up to God. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God saw the sons of Israel, and God knew them. God knew them. That's a word uh, meaning it was in his mind. He was aware of the suffering and the pain they were going through in slavery. It, it was present in his mind and it would continue to be. And so God sees them in slavery. This first section is God saves his sons and daughters from slavery and death. He saved his sons and daughters then from slavery and death. And he saves his sons and daughters today from slavery and from death. Our second passage, look right over in chapter 3. Let's read verse 7. And, and before we do that, I just want to clarify this so nobody is confused. That uh, the name of God in the Old Testament, uh, many translators have translated it as uh, Yahweh. And you might, to signify that, might capitalize Lord with all capital letters. Um, some earlier translations translated Jehovah. And so a lot of you know that. I just want to point that out so there's no confusion as I read this translation, which does translate the name Yahweh. But verse 7, And Yahweh said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. So now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come up to me, and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now come and I will send you to Pharaoh, and so you shall bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. So we see here God is now acting. He's seeing their suffering. He's seen their slavery, and he is now acting by speaking to Moses and telling them, you're going to go to Pharaoh, and you're going to tell him, let my people go, and I'm going to save them from slavery. Well, Moses does so, and Pharaoh doesn't like that. <laughs> he doesn't seem to like that. And so our third passage, turn to chapter 5. When Moses said, let my people go, Pharaoh gets angry, 
His heart is hardened because, in his view, he's the king of the earth. And he increases their labor and makes it even more difficult. And uh, we can see this in chapter 5. Look there in verse 14. Moreover, the four men of the sons of Israel, uh, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not completed your required amount either yesterday or today, and making brick as previously. Then the four men of the sons of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh, saying, Why do you deal this way with your slaves? There is no straw given to your slaves, yet they keep saying to us, Make bricks, and behold, your slaves are being beaten. But it is the sin of your people. But he said, You are lazy, lazy. Therefore you say, Let us go and sacrifice to Yahweh. So now, go labor, but straw will not be given to you, yet you must deliver the same quota of bricks. Now catch this in verse 19. Then the four men of the sons of Israel saw that they were in trouble because they were told, you must not reduce your daily amount of bricks. They knew they were in trouble. They're crying out to God for deliverance from slavery, and God is going to deliver them from slavery. We know that it was the sins of the world that enslaved us. Romans talks about we were a slave to sin and the wages of that was death. And so he say God saves them from death and slavery and he saved us who are Christians who are in Christ from death and slavery. And that's just the the application and the comparison. But something needs to uh, be talked about Um, that's our first section, and I think we understand that. We're set free from slavery and death. But look at chapter 6, chapter 6, verse 2. God further, God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh, and I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Yahweh, I was not known to them. Now we need to talk about this because turn over to Hold your spot there, but turn over to Genesis 15. Genesis chapter 15. Look there at verse 2. And Abram said, O Lord Yahweh, what will you give me as I go on being childless? And so that's the story of Abraham. But see, in Exodus, Moses said he had not revealed his name. To Abraham. But here in Genesis, he directly says in the text the Lord's name, Yahweh. What does this mean? Could this be a contradiction? Well, we know the Word of God, and we know it's clearly not. But it does imply that that name has to mean something more than how we say, my name and your name. It has to mean something more than how we just say names. His name has to mean something. And it has to mean something that was not revealed to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the way that it was revealed to Israel, his covenant people, through Moses. So what was shown to the people of Israel? And that brings us to our next section. We're going to answer that at the end of section 2. Section 2, returning to slavery... And turning to idolatry. They're saved from slavery, from physical slavery, as we are saved from spiritual slavery. And it's great that they were saved, but unfortunately the story didn't end there. Turn now back to Exodus in chapter 32. Exodus 32. They have already been saved from Egypt. They've already crossed the Red Sea. Now God is giving Moses the law on the mountain. And look at chapter 32. We'll read verse 1. Then the people saw that Moses delayed to come down the mountain. So the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Arise, make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Look at verse 3. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. 
And he took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. They made a golden calf to worship because Moses took too long. after being delivered from slavery and saved. Now we may look at them and we may say, how faithless, or that is betrayal. But let me ask you something to think about. Do you have a golden calf in your life? Do you have something you turn to and put before God because you know what God has said and what he is against? Moreover, do you turn to other things because God is taking too long? Have you done that? And I have to be honest with you, and I have to admit that I personally have as a Christian. I've sought other things. But why do we return to slavery? Why did they return to slavery? Why did they return to slavery and turn to an idol? You see, a lot of times we like to think of ancient people as just dumb and they did idol worship. But there were reasons often why they did the things they did. We'll look at one reason uh, in our second passage in this section. Uh, Hold your spot here. Turn back to Exodus 16. Exodus 16, verse 2 and 3. He says, And the whole congregation of the sons of Israel, grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of Yahweh in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to put this whole assembly to death with hunger. You see, there was a real fear. We're going to die of starvation. You know, they're in the wilderness, and we're not in heaven yet. Isn't life difficult? Isn't life hard? Might it be that our physical life seems at times it's just too hard? Might it seem that the Christian life, or just following God, it's just too hard? Or I keep sinning, I can't do it anymore. I'm not strong enough to do it. Maybe my life will be easier if I went back. If I went back to how it used to be. But it wasn't the case because things were not better. When they were in slavery, they were crying out for help. They wanted out of there. And when we were in slavery and we found the truth, we wanted out of it. We wanted forgiveness of sin. But when life gets so hard and I might be having so much anxiety, so much depression, so much fear, I don't think of the bad times and I think maybe I'd be better off if I went back to those things. And so we see The hardship of life gets to us. Another one we'll see, though, um, our our third passage is Numbers 11. So again, hold your spot in Exodus. We go to Numbers 11. Numbers 11, we'll look at starting in verse 1. Now the people became like those who complain of calamity, in the ears of uh, Yahweh. And Yahweh heard it, and his anger was kindled. Uh, So we see here that rebellion um, is already starting to happen. Um, But look at verse 4. And the rabble who were among them had greedy desires. And also the sons of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. 
Look at the next verse. But now our appetite is dried up. There is nothing at all to look at except this manna. They had the manna. The text says they had greed and desire. In other words, what we have now isn't good enough. So could it be another reason, a second reason we go back to the former things and to the slavery we've been set free from is just greed, desire. I want what they have. I want what the world has. It looks like they're having fun. It doesn't look like it's too hard for them. Maybe I'll be better off with those things like they are. So our fourth passage in this section, and I'm just going to read it, is uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Colossians 3, 5 says, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Greed is idolatry. But is greed just having to do with money? If it was, the Israelites certainly didn't have a lot of it. But they still wanted more. See, can we not covet more? Can we not seek more and not be happy with what we have? But in reality, what God gave them and what God gave us was better. But they were led away by their lusts, by their desires. By their greed. And so when looking at all of this, there's three things that, here in section two, why someone might return to slavery. Why someone might turn to idolatry. Putting something above God. Seeking something else first. And the first we looked at, uh, we seen just now, was greed and desire. It might be, my, I'm letting my own desire rule me. The other one we looked at was life is physically hard. Sometimes it's difficult, so we think we'll be better off. And the third is just implied in all of this. We think that in doing so, those things will bring us comfort. We think those things are going to help us, right? So we turn to them. But do they bring us comfort? Do they help? You know, as somebody who has done this, and sought those things from the world, I can tell you and promise you, no, they don't. And they give you nothing better and nothing that you want. But those might be reasons to turn back. But now we reach our last section. The God of loving kindness and forgiveness. We said, why? What does the name of the Lord mean then? What does God's name mean then? if he had revealed it to Israel through Moses? What does it mean? And we're going to answer that right now. They turn to idolatry. They're talking about going back to their slavery. But what is God's response? And let's look at Exodus chapter 34. And believe it or not, this is our text we're just getting to. But don't worry. (laughs) Don't worry, because I, I purposely saved the text for the end. So... We won't be here another 25 minutes. But Exodus 34, verse 5 says, Then Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood there with him, Moses, and he called upon the name of Yahweh. So there we have that right there. He, and Moses wants God to forgive the people, right? They turn to idolatry, they sinned. Earlier we hear the people mourned. And they seek forgiveness. And look what he says in verse 6. Then Yahweh passed by in front of him and called out. Now this is God saying this. And he says, Yahweh, Yahweh God. See, he's, he's describing himself. Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished and he's going to go on there and describe um, other things that we could explain about God but the point is we're going to see something about God 
for these people who turned away from him. We're going to see his compassion, that he's a God of grace, that he's slow to anger, he's loving kind. We're going to see all of this in him forgiving sin. So we could spend the rest, we could spend our life describing God. But we're going to focus on God, the forgiver, the forgiving God. You know, this was revealed to the people of Israel when they turned to idolatry. And I suggest to you that the rest of the Old Testament explains and shows more and more about who God is and His character. And I also suggest to you that we do not see that full revelation until we see Jesus Christ. You know, it's manifested in Him, the character of God. It is made known to us in Him. But He's forgiving. And so we know they're, they're saved from slavery as we are. We know they turn away and they turn to idolatry. They're wanting to go back to slavery. But last we see a God of forgiveness. So now I'm going to give you three examples of this God of forgiveness. And the first one is the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, Adam and Eve is our first example. They felt naked after they sinned because they sinned. It was the sin that caused them to feel that way. And look at verse 7. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Then they heard the sound of Yahweh God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves uh, from the presence of Yahweh God in the midst of the trees of the garden. Yahweh God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid you. Now, does that sound like a furious God who you sinned and now I'm going to come and, and punish you and destroy you and hurt you? We already, here in Exodus, he will not leave the guilty unpunished. So there was a consequence for what they did, but he's just walking in the cool of the day and he simply asks, where are you? And then you drop down to verse 21, then Yahweh God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. They were naked and ashamed and humiliated because of their sin. And they're hiding from God, and God clothes them. The forgiving God. Uh, look at Genesis chapter 4. Uh, our next example is Cain. Now, although we don't know everything about, we don't know the rest of his life, but we can still see God's compassion. We can still see his compassion because when Cain is thinking about murdering Abel, God says, why is your face fallen? If you do good, won't your face be lifted up? Won't you feel good if you do good? But Cain doesn't listen, and he murders his brother. But when you see that, um, drop down to what Cain says after he murders him. When God gives him his punishment. Cain said in verse 13. Cain said to Yahweh. My punishment is too great to bear. Look at God's response in verse 15. So Yahweh said to him. Therefore whoever kills Cain. Vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And Yahweh appointed a sign for Cain. So that no one who found him would strike him. Even after murder. God shows compassion. And our third example is Israel themselves. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 12. And this is probably one of the most personal and intimate sections of the Bible for me because of personal sin. 1 Samuel 12, to sum it up, they ask for a king. They already have a king. God is their king. But they're seeing what other people have. They're seeing the world around them. And they're asking for a man king who in no way is better than having God. It's revealed to them that they sin and they see the thunder and the rain and the storms and it says that they are in fear, they're in terror. They're in terror. But look what, Sa what God says to them uh, through Samuel in verse 20. 
do not fear. You have committed all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following Yahweh, but serve Yahweh with all your heart, and you must not turn aside, for then you would go after meaningless things which cannot profit and cannot deliver, because they are meaningless. For Yahweh will not abandon His people on account of His great name, because Yahweh has been pleased to make you a people for Himself. Look at verse 24. Only fear Yahweh and serve Him in truth, with all your heart, for see what great things he has done for you. You see, we're still like Adam. And this is the lesson today. That when I sin, and maybe I'm struggling with something, I'm putting something above God in my life because it's a real sin I'm struggling with, and I pray to get over it, but I end up sinning again. My response is, Adam, let me hide from him. Let me run away from him. But he says, if you... Don't return to the Lord. If you go that way and you keep going that way, you're going to go to futile things, meaningless things that can't profit or deliver. It doesn't help anything. You see, we don't want to pray because it's like, God, I just did the same thing again. We want to run away from God And God wants us to run to him, catch this, when we sin. And that's the hard part because we don't feel good. We feel guilt. But when we don't want to pray in those times, God is saying, that's when you need to pray. Come to me. And so if you'll just give me... A couple more minutes. Um, I said I would give you those three examples and then leave you with one more passage of Scripture and an illustration. So based on what we're talking about, what do we, knowing who God is and that He's the forgiver and that we need to run to Him when we mess up so that we can be helped with our sin problem, turn to 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, starting in verse 28. And now, verse 28, And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he is manifested, we may have confidence, and catch this, not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Sound familiar? If you know that he is righteous, You know that everyone also who does righteousness has been born of him. See how great the love the Father has given to us that we would be called children of God, sons and daughters of God. And we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. If you will, uh, drop down to verse 6. No one who abides in him sins. means continues to sin, continues to walk in sin and go that way. No one who sins, continues to sin, has seen him or has come to know him. Verse 8, the one who does sin, again continues, is of the devil. Because the devil sins from the beginning. The Son of God was manifested for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. Look at verse 10. By this the children of God and the, and the children of the devil are manifested or made known. Everyone who does not do righteousness is not of God. So you have children, sons and daughters of the devil, and you have sons and daughters of God. And so here's the illustration I'd like to leave with you. If you're here, if you're in Christ, if you're a Christian, and you have that good, happy, loving relationship with God. You love God and God loves you. But you have the sin problem, as we all do. Um, you have the sin problem. You know, I don't have children, but I, you know, I would assume that a lot of people in this congregation have children. And So you're in that same loving relationship with your child, 
like how we are with God. You are with your father. Now, can you imagine the most evil, wicked, nasty, ugly person wants to come when you're with your child and try to take your child away? What's going to be your response? Not a chance, I would assume. You're not taking my daughter. You're not taking my son. Not a chance. What it tells us is this. You have to choose to leave God. And this brings everything together because whether you're over the age of 60, uh, under the age of 30, under the age of 25, we are sons and daughters of God. And so when we do that same thing, Satan is saying, God hates you. We want to feel that way. You sinned. You don't deserve heaven. You don't deserve forgiveness. You deserve punishment. You're no good. And you see what's happening. We're not going to God. We keep going further and further and further with the stranger trying to take us away. Why? Because we're continuing in this way. We just, we're being deceived because, yes, we have that sin, but when we mess up, Satan wants to take us away from God. He wants us to run away from God. And God wants us to run to him. That's going to stop us from continuing to sin. And you know, I think in the church we have to get away from this mindset where we think we have to look perfect all the time. Because what about the person who's sitting down who's not perfect, who's struggling with this problem? I feel I, I can't go to anyone because everyone's perfect. And guess what? I'm not. I'm not. And so I say that to make this following point as we close. That with all of that being said, let's bring it to real life. I drank and I got drunk Saturday night. Well, I can't go to church the next morning. I can't take communion. I can't sing to God. I can't pray to him. Look what I just did. I told him I wouldn't do it. I told him I'd try to stop and I did it again. Okay? And what happens next Saturday night? If you don't come to his presence when you sin then, what happens about the next week? Okay. I watched another explicit video. I can't pray to him. I just told him I wouldn't. I just told him I stopped, that I repented. And what happens Tuesday? What happens Wednesday? What happens Thursday? As someone who was out there, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I don't want to follow God anymore. But you go further and further and further away. And why? Because the more you don't run to him, the more you're turning to meaningless things. And you're going in the direction of Satan. It doesn't help. How great is it that we have a God of forgiveness? How great is it that he knew about your sin problem and he'll help you with it? How great is it that when the nails were being hammered through his uh, hands and when he was on the cross, he knew you would have a sin problem? And that he says, come to me. When other helpers fail, when comforts flee, Help of the helpless, abide with me. Change and decay, and all around I see. O oh, you who changes not, abide with me.
sisters, brothers, stay with him. Abide with him. Because he loves you and he's always ready to forgive you and to help you, not hurt you. Thank you.